Welcome back to your last at-home lecture on blood. This particular lecture is all about leukocytes. Leukocytes, of course, are white blood cells. And the, the main function of leukocytes is to defend the body. And the leukocytes defend the body against lots of things. Um, viruses, bacteria, um, parasitic worms, to name a few. Additionally, some leukocytes can actually defend against things like cancer. So um, they're very good at protecting the body. Um, some leukocytes um, don't necessarily defend us against cancer cells or viruses, but what they do is they um, aid inflammation. And inflammation is a protective mechanism that helps to prevent the spread of infection. And you're probably familiar with the cardinal signs of inflammation. Um, if you've ever, you know, um, had inflamed skin, you've probably noticed that the area of inflammation is swollen. So that's one characteristic or one cardinal sign, if you will, is swelling. Um, Another cardinal sign is warmth or heat, so an inflamed area is usually warm. Um, another cardinal sign is redness. So in someone that has light skin, when their skin is inflamed, you can very easily see the redness associated with the inflammation. Um, another cardinal sign of inflammation is pain. Um, the pain is actually there to let us know that, that there's been damage or infection and that we should probably not use that particular part for a little while until it heals. Um, so three of those cardinal signs, swelling, heat, and redness, are all due basically to one thing. Due to the fact that blood is flowing to the area of, uh, of the area of the, of the damage or the potential infection. Um, as you recall, hopefully blood is red, hence why um, inflamed areas are red. You get all this blood flowing there. Blood is also warm, warmer than body temperature, hence why inflamed areas are warm. Um, additionally, because you have so much fluid coming to the area, you get the swelling. So most of those cardinal signs are due to the, the blood coming to the area. Why do we want blood to come to the area? Well. If you have a potential um, infecting substance in the area, then with the blood, you'll be bringing in white blood cells that can kill the virus or bacteria or whatever that might be in the area. Also coming in with the blood will be things that will help to heal any damage. So despite the fact that inflammation is painful, um, it is a process that can help the body to heal. All right, so now we're gonna look at our different types of leukocytes. There's five types of leukocytes neutrophils, eosinophils, basophils, monocytes, and lymphocytes. We'll take a look at each of these. So the first one we're gonna look at are the, are the neutrophils, and they are the most abundant of all the white blood cells. In terms of their appearance, so we can see a, a neutrophil over here in the picture, and here's a red blood cell to give you a, a size comparison. Um, generally speaking, all leukocytes will be larger than a red blood cell. So you can see this neutrophil is larger than a red blood cell, but it looks very different. Now, um, whenever we look at the leukocytes in this class, they will have been stained. So this, this leukocyte, this neutrophil in the picture has been stained. And one of the most striking things about the neutrophil is the very large lobe nucleus that it has. So you can see its nucleus and it has one, two, three, four lobes that are visible to us from this point of view. And that's all just one nucleus, just in these, these uh, lobed segments, if you will. Um, another characteristic of a neutrophil is a very pale, usually pale purple cytoplasm. So you can see in the background, we have sort of a pale purple. But then you also see these granules, these little spots all over the place. Those um, often stain red or dark purple. So usually the granules in the cytoplasm of the neutrophil will stain darker than the cytoplasm itself. Those granules are chock full of compounds that can help the neutrophil to destroy bacteria. And that's really what neutrophils are best at is they can destroy bacteria. Um, and they do this via bulk eating. And there's a technical term for bulk eating 
and maybe you're, you remember this from your previous biology class, the term is phagocytosis. So neutrophils are phagocytic in nature. They basically gobble up the bacteria and that's how they get rid of them. Next we see an eosinophil, rather strange looking white blood cell. Um, like a neutrophil, the eosinophil also has a lobed nucleus, but usually just two lobes. So you can see one, two lobes for this nucleus, but even more striking is the cytoplasm. You see all of these dark red granules in the cytoplasm here. That's very characteristic of an eosinophil. And they have very dark red or orange granules in their cytoplasm. And these granules are chock full of compounds that can help the eosinophil to fight off parasitic infections. So the eosinophils are very famous for their ability to do things like um, fight off parasitic worms and those types of things. Here we have a basophil. And when you look at the basophil, one of the first things you notice is that you can't really see a nucleus. It's there, it's just masked. It's masked by all the granules in the cytoplasm. Um, so there's many, many, many very dark staining granules in the cytoplasm of the basophil that kind of hide the nucleus. Um, these dark staining granules are full of chemicals that aid inflammation. So basophils are the particular leukocyte that promotes inflammation. Now the granules within the basophil are primarily filled with two things, histamine and heparin. Histamine is a chemical that's a very potent vasodilator. What that means is it causes blood vessels to dilate. And when a blood vessel dilates, it gets bigger. If you remember in the process of inflammation, we wanna bring more blood to the area of damage or infection. One way to do that is just to make the blood vessels in that area bigger so that more blood can get in. Additionally, these granules contain heparin. Heparin is an anticoagulant. It prevents blood from clotting too quickly. So oftentimes at the, at the area of infection or damage, we'll have some broken blood vessels. And we're gonna need those to clot so that all the blood doesn't leak out of the circulatory system. But you don't want clotting to occur too quickly because then you can't get the blood to the area, bringing with it your defensive cells and things that can help to repair. So you want it to clot, but not too quickly. So the heparin kind of prevents blood from, from clotting too quickly. Next, we have monocytes. And these are usually the largest of the leukocytes. Um, they have a, a nucleus. In this picture, it looks almost like a heart shape. They have a very large nucleus. And that's one of their characteristics is they have a very, very, very big nucleus. And the nucleus is often shaped like a heart or a U. That's very characteristic of a monocyte. Monocytes in the bloodstream don't really have any function. They develop their function once they leave the bloodstream. When a monocyte leaves the bloodstream, it turns into a macrophage, one of those large eating cells that we talked about um, with the spleen. So they turn into a macrophage and uh, macrophages are very good at destroying bacteria. Basically you can gobble up bacteria and get rid of uh, bacterial infections. Um, despite the fact it looks like there's granules in the cytoplasm here, um, there really aren't as many granules in the, in the cytoplasm of a monocyte as compared to the leukocytes we looked at previously. So monocytes are considered to be agranulocytes. And if you put that letter A in front of something in biology, it means not. So they're considered to not possess, possess granules in their cytoplasm. Um, as we'll learn about later in the semester, um, macrophages are very important for alerting uh, the immune system to specific infection types. And last but not least for the leukocytes are the lymphocytes. Right? Like the monocytes, lymphocytes are agranulocytes, so they don't possess uh, very many granules in their cytoplasm, at least not as many granules as compared to neutrophils, basophils, and eosinophils. Um, they're the second most abundant of all the leukocytes. So the first most abundant are the neutrophils and the next are the, are the lymphocytes. And this is a typical lymphocyte. Um, lymphocytes have a very large nucleus. Oftentimes the nucleus will look like it takes up the whole entire cell. Sometimes you don't even see any cytoplasm um, because the, the nucleus is so big. 
very large, very round nucleus, very dark purple nucleus. Okay, and we can just see a thin sliver of pale cytoplasm around it. Um, the lymphocytes get their name from the fact that they're not only found in the blood, but they're also found in the lymphatic system. So we find a lot of lymphocytes in our lymphatic fluid and in our lymph nodes. Um, and we can find them in a lot of other places too. There's several subclasses of lymphocytes. The primary subclasses being T cells, B cells, and natural killer cells. Um, T cells and B cells are very important for the specific immune response. Like for instance, T cells are capable of, of uh, killing specific viruses, um, and T cells are also important for activating B cells. The B cells have the very important job of producing antibodies, which are proteins that can help to clear infection. The natural killer cells are very different from T cells and B cells. Um, for the most part, they work non-specifically, so they're not part of the specific immune response. Um, and one of their main jobs is to um, is to fight cancer cells, actually. Sorry, what we're going to do next is I'm going to have you look at these next few slides. Um, they're a series of blood smears. So what I would like you to do is pause the video and look at the white blood cells in the slides and see if you can identify them as being a neutrophil, an eosinophil, a basophil, a monocyte or a lymphocyte. So go ahead and pause the video and take a look. Um, I guess you, I guess you can't pause the video now. That I think about it. <laughs> You're going to have to just uh, um, move as, as the slide moves on. You're going to have to pause the video for each uh, each particular slide. So this cell here, this one here, this one here and this one here. See if you can identify those. Go ahead and pause. Now these two cells here, they're kind of mashed up against each other, but two completely different cells. But I don't know if the color is going to come across very nicely for you, but I'm, I want to tell you that the granules in this cell cytoplasm are um, reddish to orangish in color. So see if you can identify these two leukocytes. And this one, and this one, and then two more. This one here, and this strange looking thing here. Okay, the next thing we're going to talk about are or is rather leukocyte movement. So leukocytes obviously have to move around. Now when the leukocytes are in blood, well blood's moving so obviously the leukocytes are flowing with blood, but the leukocytes have to be able to leave the bloodstream and go to areas where there's infection and damage. Um, this involves uh, two processes called margination and diapedesis, sometimes collectively referred to as emigration. And I want to show you a video that kind of goes along with this. So we're supposed to be inside the bloodstream right now. And you can see we have red blood cells and white blood cells. And this is outside the bloodstream. Um, there's, this is a cell releasing chemicals. It's sending out a red alert saying there's some sort of damage, there's some sort of infection in the area. So all those things were alert signals coming out of that, that cell. So now we can see that the wall of the blood vessel is changing a little bit, and that's due to all those chemicals that were being released by the the cell at the area of damage. Now here we have a white blood cell and it's bumping up against the walls of the blood vessel. So there's our cell sending out the red alert and you can see here the signals coming through on the blood vessel wall. The blood vessel wall is changing in response to this damaged cell. Now our white blood cell is going to come along and recognize 
this and say, okay, I need to stop here and get out because on the other side of this blood vessel is a, a cell that needs help. So this is the process of margination. It's going to the margins. The white blood cell is going to the margins of the blood vessel. And now we're going to watch the process of diapedesis. Diapedesis is the process of the white blood cell slipping out of the blood vessel. It's, the blood vessel itself is made of cells. And so the white blood cell has to squeeze between the cells that make up the blood vessel wall in order to get out of the blood vessel towards the area of damage. So in this picture here, you can see this leukocyte squeezing out of the blood vessel and it's going between cells, that's diapedesis there. Once the leukocytes move into the tissues, they can move around in the tissues with amoeboid type of movement, type movement. So if you're familiar with the way an amoeba moves, it kind of just slugs along. That's how the leukocytes move in tissues. Um, what's driving their movement is chemotaxis. Um, what that means is that the white blood cells are always moving towards some sort of chemical, such as we saw in that video where the damaged cell was releasing chemicals. Well, the white blood cell will be attracted to those chemicals and will move along towards it. Uh, the last topic here is leukopoiesis, which sounds a lot like erythropoiesis, which sounds a lot like hematopoiesis. Hematopoiesis was the process of forming the formed elements of blood. So leukopoiesis is specifically the form of a hematopoiesis for leukocytes, so the production of leukocytes. So just like with all the other formed elements, the leukocytes are produced in the red bone marrow. So despite the fact that we call these white blood cells, they are produced in the red bone marrow. And again, we start with that same multipotent hematopoietic stem cell that we use to make the erythrocytes, um, but different chemicals will cause that stem cell to turn into either the lymphoid progenitor cell or the myeloid progenitor cell. The lymphoid progenitor cells are going to turn into our lymphocytes, like T cells and B cells. The myeloid progenitor cells, <clears throat> excuse me, depending upon the um, chemicals present, the myeloid progenitor cell might turn into a neutrophil, or given a different set of chemicals, it might turn into an eosinophil so on and so forth. And so that's the process, process excuse me, of leukopoiesis. Oop, I forgot I had one more thing here, um, and that was to take a look at some selected disorders that are associated with leukocytes. Um, I want to talk about two conditions, leukocytosis and leukopenia, and these are opposites. Um, leukocytosis means having too many leukocytes, Whereas leukopenia, penia means poverty or lacking, leukopenia is having too few leukocytes. So going back to leukocytosis, um, if you have um, an infection, um, that's a, 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 probably a good time to have a higher than normal amount of white blood cells because your white blood cells will help you to fight the infection. So um, if you don't know if you have an infection or not and your doctor does some blood work, and they see that your white blood cell count is high, then that could be um, an indication that you do have an infection. Also during allergic reaction, the white blood cell count will be elevated. Now leukemia is a condition um, in which there's a high white blood cell count. So leukemia um, is manifested as a form of leukocytosis. If you look over here, this is a normal blood smear. This is a blood smear from someone with leukemia. All these purple things are white blood cells. Um, and you might think, whoa, someone with leukemia, you know, they have a lot of white blood cells. They must be really good at defending against infection. But that's not necessarily the case, or that is definitely not the case, I should say. Um, the white blood cells that are overproduced in leukemia are non-functioning. So um, they, they do not work to help fight infection. Um, so this is a, a very uh, dangerous condition. Leukopenia is a lower than normal amount of white blood cells. Um, leukopenia can happen um, during certain poisoning cases. It can be caused by radiation. Um, and certain infections can cause leukopenia. Now, most infections will cause leukocytosis, but certain specific infections can cause leukopenia. For example, HIV infection, so HIV is a virus, 
um, when someone is infected with HIV, um, what eventually happens during the progression of the disease is that the HIV virus selectively um, infects and destroys T cells. So what happens during an HIV infection is the T cell count will eventually go down. So you lose white blood cells. It will cause a form of leukopenia, specifically of T cells. And actually that's how they um, can distinguish uh, between someone having just an HIV infection and someone actually having AIDS. The difference between the two is the T cell count. There are many individuals that will have an HIV infection and they'll never actually get AIDS if their T cell count doesn't drop below a certain level. And that's it. Thank you.